This episode of DC A Jazz Series is brought to you by the DC Jazz Festival. Join us in celebrating the legacy of Larry Applebaum and his significant contribution to the Library of Congress's Magnetic Recordings Laboratory. Check out this episode titled, I Found Monk, Train, and More. Larry Applebaum is was, was just incredible in terms of his knowledge and, and his contributions. Uh, to the music, uh, a, a lot of it was, was often in the background. Well, Larry Applebaum, um, my main connection with Larry Applebaum and experience with Larry Applebaum is as a, a fellow long time, decades long time radio programmer at WPFW, uh, Washington's community radio station. And Larry, for many years, uh, has a program on Sunday afternoons called, called The Sound of Surprise. And that was related to an old phrase from a jazz critic that he took up on as a kind of a philosophical aspect to his program because he was about playing a wide range of music on his program. But then Larry also, for his day job, Larry worked at the Library of Congress. Larry uh, started doing radio as a student at, at the University of Maryland and, and later became a, a programmer with, with WPFW. But his day job was with the Library of Congress. He, he worked there as a summer intern before he graduated from Maryland and then got a job uh, in the audio division at first. And, and he worked there for uh, a number of years researching uh, audio recordings, uh, 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 programs that, the, for example, that the uh, uh, Voice of America did of concerts uh, uh, recorded at, at various uh, performances over the years, and he would be, be, be checking them out. My name is Mike Turpin. I am a recording engineer, audiovisual production specialist for the music division here at the Library of Congress. Well, Larry, Larry Applebaum and I started working in the Magnetic Recording Lab, which it was called in those days, in, on the same day um, quite a while ago. At that time, we were engineers slash trainees. I started working there in 1979. I, did, I had three different careers there. One, the first was while I was still in school, I was I became what's called a deck attendant. I worked with the collections themselves, physically, with um, pulling books off the shelf and so on. And that, was, that enabled me to get a sense of how you organize a collection and how things are cataloged, for example. And that was, I think, a really fundamental uh, lesson for me was the ability to, I also started working in the main reading room and that's when I started to talk to scholars who were there from all over the world and that started to have some real meaning for me. And so I thought, oh, well this is, this is something I could actually do for a living. I could do this for life. And that was really interesting for me. I then, I graduated from university and saw a job for an audiovisual production specialist trainee position. I went for that job and I got it because I had already been doing radio at that time and I thought, oh, well, this, is, this suits me and my interests a little bit more and I thought that was quite interesting. One of the reasons we were hired was um, the MBRS division, that's Motion Picture Broadcast and Recorded Sound. It was a new division within the library. And they had just received a large collection of NBC radio discs. These are 16-inch transcription discs that were made by NBC uh, radio as air checks. In those days, radio stations and networks would record all of their programs on these discs and use them for either for reference or for uh, delayed broadcasts for the West Coast because of the time difference. 
Most of the programs on network radio were done live on the East Coast, but if you had, you know, an eight o'clock show to play it on the West Coast, it would only be five o'clock, so they had to have a recording to play later. So that was, that was the, um, the mainstay of our job in those days, was to take these discs and record them onto uh, analog tape. This was all before digital. Nothing was digital in those days. This was 1981 through probably most of the 80s. One of the first things that Larry and I learned about each other was that we share a deep love for jazz. And um, in those days, the music division had virtually no jazz programming on the concert series and virtually no jazz in the collections. So we, and especially Larry, sort of um, made it a mission to bring jazz to the library through collections and through concerts. When the audio-visual department of the Library of Congress was moving to, uh, I think it was like way out in Virginia, Larry switched jobs to the music division. And, and there, in working with the music division, he, he worked with uh, obtaining the, the, the papers and other documents of, of prominent musicians. After our division of motion picture broadcasting and recorded sound moved to Culpeper, Virginia, they opened a new conservation center out there. I chose not to relocate, and so I, I moved over to the music division. They had a real need for a a reference specialist who had a strong interest and knowledge of jazz, and so they needed somebody to work on acquisitions, for example, and that's what I ended up doing. As we got more into the job, more collections were coming in. We, we received uh, tapes from the Voice of America, um, the United Nations. We worked on many different recorded sound collections in those days. And in addition to that, we also were uh, helping the music division with the concert series, recording the concerts and uh, preserving them on tape as well. I'm Michelle Lambert Glimp and I'm a music specialist in the concert office. How long have you been affiliated with the Library of Congress? 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a wonderful space. I am very fortunate to be able to be a part of history with bringing in the collections that Larry have brought in and other collections that have come in. And I do think it's our duty to put all this information, the music, the lyrics, everything out to the world to see. So I do feel that it's an important place to be at the Library of Congress. The recording laboratory in those days used to document all the things that were happening at the library. For example, all the lectures, the symposia, the public events, the readings, and so on. We would video and audio tape those for the collection. We would record all the concerts, for example, uh, all the chamber music concerts in the Coolidge Auditorium and all the events that were taking place around the library. And we would also start working on preservation reformatting of the audio, video, and film collections. That is, you take an old radio recording on a transcription disc that's falling apart, and you would transfer it onto something more stable and uh, take detailed notes on what you're doing. And so that's a large part of what we ended up doing. Oh, I've known Larry since I've been here. Um, he worked in uh, recorded sounds er earlier and then he came to the music division. And um, Larry is a wonderful individual. His knowledge of jazz always excited me. If I had a question, there wasn't a question that he couldn't answer about jazz. And he was jazz. He was that cool, laid back kind of guy. Um, nothing could ever get him upset. You know, he's just, and he knew he knew what he knew. Larry is a very detailed oriented person. And which is good if you're a jazz researcher or scholar because it's more, 
when you're talking about jazz recordings, um, it's it's often more than just about the headliner. We want to know, jazz fans want to know who's playing the bass, who's playing the drums, who's, you know, who wrote the song, who wrote the lyrics. Um, th these details that a lot of people maybe in other types of music may not care so much about. Um, we want to know, you know, where they're touring, when, where they came from, uh, how did they get into, the, you know, how did they pick their instrument, that kind of thing. And those are the things that Larry is really good at um, digging for and bringing out. Oh, the library has a very long history going back to the Archive of Folk Song and the American Folklife Center that uh, hired uh, John and Alan Lomax to go out and do field recordings. They would actually literally go out to communities around the country and document folk songs. And that was really interesting, that what they ended up capturing, the legacy for the Library of Congress. And, for example, they also invited Jelly Roll Morton, who was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, in 1939. He was living here. They invited him to come to the library and do a, a kind of on-site field recording in which he talked about how he invented jazz in New Orleans. This is one of the first great oral histories of jazz. The library's collections come from different places. First of all, the United States Copyright Office is located within the library. So, for example, when you copyright a sound recording or you copyright a composition, you are expected to send in a copy to, to the library. At the same time, when you're registering your work, you're supposed to send in a copyright lead sheet that goes with your composition. And so we, the library has literally millions of these copyright deposit lead sheets. Extraordinary collection that, um, and many times they're in the hands of these creators. Each division has their own acquisition team that goes out and tries to develop their collections. I was one of the specialists who would literally make contacts collections go out and solicit collections for, you know, have you thought about donating your collection either to the library or have you thought about a home for your collection? And so we would talk about why the library might be an appropriate place to uh, donate their collection. Even before he switched jobs, one of the, 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 the incredible acquisitions that they had was, was of Charles Mingus. And, and visiting Larry at the, at the uh, library one time, he showed me what, what was available there, including uh, uh, there, there was written scores for a massive piece that, that would be called Epitaph. And, and uh, some years after Mingus's passing, Sue Mingus, uh, well, actually it was a, a scholar looking through this, saying, hey, this, this is something that, that, that needs to be done. And, and it became a, a posthumous performance of, of Mingus's work that, you know, was part of what was at the, at the Library of Congress. So he worked on, on acquisitions and, 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 and worked with getting the, 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 the papers and other documentation of Max Roach, for example. The Eric Dolphy family, I think, has contributed to scores and things like that. So he worked, worked along those lines also and, and would give presentations. Uh, to assess collections, there are people that I would have on my hit list of people that I thought were among the most significant names that are out there. I mean, the Mingus collection actually came in before I got to the music division. I actually worked to acquire the Max Roach collection. Now, I had known Max before that. He had come to visit the library a couple of times. He came and gave a talk one time and he also came and visited us and so he I think really wanted he was already at that time thinking about 
his collection and his place in history. So I think that was fortuitous for all of us that he was already in a position to make some, I, some, make some decisions about preserving and providing access to these materials. One of the things that I really enjoyed is when he would do show and tells. So he would bring out materials from the collection and the knowledge that he had on different musicians, even when the actual musician was here and he brought out their materials. He could tell them things about their materials that they had forgotten. So I always found that to be extremely interesting and I felt that, you know, his knowledge was priceless for our institution as a whole. I think it's just, it's just a natural curiosity how this music evolves, why it's played a certain way, you know, musicians bring a certain personality to their playing and uh, I think, you know, we just kind of pick up on that. Well, you have to determine, A, what is in the collection, what kind of formats, rough idea of the numbers, and you would need to get a sense of how rare or unusual things are. So, for example, the library has an extraordinary collection of recorded sound, both commercially published and unpublished materials. And so there are, I would need to give a heads up to the curator of recorded sound and say, hey, there's a possibility for an acquisition of a jazz uh, researcher and journalist and DJ who has this kind of collection, this many numbers, approximately 10 to 15,000 sound recordings, and they would include this kind of material or that kind of. Uh, this is why we should go after these collections. So you would basically have to assess the historical or cultural significance of the collection, and that would enable people to make decisions about do we want this or do we not. One of the things that I was amazed by is the Voice of America collection. We have, or the library has about 50,000 reels of acetate tape of everything that was broadcast on, and even the raw materials that were broadcast on Voice of America. And so that's an amazing collection. We came across uh, a Duke Ellington concert with um, the Belgian jazz guitarist Django Reinhardt, who, who came to the States in 1946, I think, and played some concerts with Duke and uh, he's playing electric guitar in 1946. It was pretty early to have an amplified guitar and it's just, it's an incredible recording. So we were excited about that. Another one that we found was um, another Ellington recording. One of Duke's most popular recordings was Ellington at Newport, 1956, I think. And on that recording, his saxophonist, Paul Gonzalez, takes a very extended solo, but there were two microphones on stage. One was the one for Columbia Records, which was record producing the album, and the other mic was Voice of America. He played into the Voice of America microphone, so his solo is crystal clear on that, and it's kind of off on the other one. So we discovered that that recording among the VOA recordings, uh, tapes, and uh, we were just blown away because we had all heard that album on Columbia, and, and it's like, well, Paul, is, he sounds a little distant. So we put this on and, man, you know, there he is, you know. And so we were excited about that, and of course that has now been released as well. Those were two recordings that we were really excited about. Uh, I w visited him one time, and he's saying, "Well, this was at Newport, you know, 1958, or this is, uh, you know, different things." And, and one of the significant discoveries he made was uh, a, a concert done by Thelonious Monk 
one of his, I guess you could say, one of the real touchstones of his career at the Library of Congress was when he uh, discovered a tape or, or a series of tape that uh, turned out to be some of the few recordings, uh, live recordings or live or studio recordings of uh, John Coltrane's experience with the Thelonious Monk Quartet. Well, the Monk Coltrane tape was discovered among the Voice of America collection. Uh, among a batch of tapes that were brought to us of Voice of America tapes. So there was literally a truck filled with tapes that came to us and we, I was thumbing through them saying, oh, this is what we're going to be working on for the next month. And I thought, this is interesting stuff. And that's where I found the Thelonious Monk Quartet with John Coltrane recordings that were later issued by Blue Note Records. There was a lot of excitement because this was something that nobody knew about. And to, to have uh, Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane, two of the giants of jazz, of progressive jazz, uh, to find an entire concert that they played together and this had never been heard, never been released anywhere. It's pretty exciting. There was a lot of buzz about that, um, people inquiring and of course Larry, um, by that time Larry was very well known in the jazz community, not just in DC but you know around the country and even the world. And so there was a lot of interest in this. It just kind of had a life, took on a life of its own from there. Um, in the case of the Thelonious Monk with John Coltrane quartet recordings, literally we were in the process of preserving them. So I literally, I saw a batch of tapes that were brought to us to preserve. And I saw, hmm, these are called, these tapes are called Carnegie Hall Jazz. 1957 and I thought hmm, interesting year and so I looked on the back of one of the reels and it just said written in pencil it said Thelonious Monk Quartet it didn't say John Coltrane it just said Thelonious Monk Quartet and some song titles that was it and so it's only when we put the tape on the machine and I started to listen to it and I thought that's John Coltrane, because you know, you know John Coltrane's sound. It's like everybody knows, oh, this is, this is the one and only. And that was a very important part of John Coltrane's uh, evolution, was his time with Monk. And that discovery led to a worldwide album release it was finally released uh, as a legitimate recording with, with the approval of the, you know, the Monk family and, and all of the rights taken care of and everything like that. The only this Monk Quartet, Carnegie Hall with John Coltrane on the Blue Note label, which is a legendary jazz label. And that recording garnered a ton of acclaim, as rightfully it should, because it was a beautiful recording. You know, that was one of the, the significant discoveries that he had. In addition to things like that, Larry annually hosted a jazz on film series at the Library of Congress where he engaged their vast resources to uh, present a free film series at the Library of Congress. One, one of the presentations that he would give at the library would be jazz films and he'd have, he'd have uh, uh, people introduce the films uh, as, uh, as part of the program. One of the significant films that he was showing was a, was a documentary about uh, uh, Dexter Gordon and he asked me to, to do the, the introductions to the film and I said sure I'd be glad to. And I think Larry's presence also spurred the Library of Congress to, to present more jazz concerts and performances as well. His impact on the library I think is just expanding the interest in jazz and a lot of I think people that before Larry came may not have thought of the Library of Congress as a place to hear jazz or to research jazz uh, recordings and now they do. 
I think he represents the best of a music specialist within the division. As Mike said, jazz wasn't a main focus of ours. Um, we had a lot of music, but jazz wasn't one of those. And Larry saw that. So he saw a need and he went out and he got collections and he brought in material. So I think the young people coming in, you know, think about what your passion is. And if your passion isn't here, bring it here. Actually, I don't think about my own legacy very much at all. I've, I've been thinking about it for a time when I had some health problems and I couldn't do my radio show for a long time. And that was, I missed it so much. And I realized, what am I missing? I'm missing this connection that you have with the audience. And that is one of the most important things that we can do here, is that we connect people with music. This is why we do what we do. We're trying to help create an audience for this music. We're helping to let people know something about these artists. We're helping to give people an experience of this music and let people know the story of this music. That's what all of us do, I think, as people who love this music. I mean, there's, you know, just so many things I could say about the guy. He's, he's a great friend. Larry did a great job in building our jazz collection. He did a great job in bringing some very instrumental jazz musicians to the library. And he did a lot of interviewing here at the library. So I think the library would be a different place if Larry had never come through.